Welcome, welcome, welcome to Earth Day and Ecumenical Advocacy Day. And I know you might be familiar with Earth Day, but you're probably going, well, what is Ecumenical Advocacy Day? Well, this is a movement of the ecumenical Christian community that's grounded in biblical witness, and it's a shared tradition of justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. And so through worship, theological reflection, and opportunities for learning and witnessing, the goal is to strengthen our Christian voice and to mobilize for advocacy to assure justice for all. So come and join with us in this worship experience. As always, we tell you to invite your friends, gather up your family, share the worship experience, host a watch party, do all of that, and then prepare your sacred space as we go in to worship, beginning with our call. Triune God, on this day where we celebrate your earth and ecumenical advocacy, we come to dwell in the midst of your infinite love. We come to contemplate you and celebrate the beauty of your universe. We come to awaken our praise and thankfulness for every being that you have created. Oh God of love, we come to you so you may show us our place in this world as ambassadors of your love for all of your creatures, big and small. We come to be seized by your power and your light, enabling us and preparing us for the brighter future we know that you have for us, fulfilled with justice, peace, love, and peace. We come to praise you, O oh God most high, praising you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our soul. Let us now go to the throne of grace. Oh Father in heaven, we come to you with thanksgiving in our hearts today. We're happy that the seasons are changing. We know you're in charge. And as I walked through my yard and I saw the little flowers coming up and, and I could see their little heads peeking through and, and I could feel their beauty, it just made me love you more. Yes, because yes. no matter what happens, you're still in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still take care every day, every season. It happens when it's supposed to, how it's supposed to, because you are in charge. Father, like the little flowers, we ask that you come and fall fresh on us today, that you stir up our gifts, and that you use us in the glorification of your kingdom. Father, we just want to feel your warmth like you're warming the ground around us. We want to feel your love like you're loving the flowers. Father, we thank you for everything you've done for us, small or large. We ask that you come into this service, that you fall fresh in this service that you use everyone in this service, that you use all our gifts. And Father, for those of us that's not sure of our gifts, give us a little time and help us to work on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Father, we come to please you. No matter what's going on in this world, we know that you're in charge, and we know that you've got it under control. We take this time to worship you in the highest. We give you the highest praise. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. and amen. Amen.
exalt thee, O Lord. Ah, and we have much, much to be thankful for and to just exalt and sing God's praises for. Ah, as Denise prayed just for the sunshine and the warmth. You know, we had snow this week. So seeing these warm, warm temperatures and watching the plants bud up from the ground, what a blessing for which we just ought to give God praise. And that's just one of the small things. Hallelujah, because we know. God has kept us. God has just truly undergirded us. You know, he kept us safe from harm and danger, some that we saw and some that we didn't even see. Ah, but God was right there holding on, keeping us close, holding us tight. So yes, yes, we come and we exalt thee. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I, of course, am giving thanks for our uh, worship team, our worship team. And we got Reverend Manet back in the house. Amen. Amen. We are giving God thanks and exalting him for his healing, healing powers. Having kept her safe and brought her back. And, uh, of course, Stuart Potem, who you heard her just a moment ago, lifting up that prayer. Behind the camera, we got Jessica in the cut. We got Paul. And, of course, oh, uh, we got a new addition to the team. We got Tasha over there helping us out. So, yeah, thank you for that. Yes, yes. Ah, and then this, uh, the maestro of song, Reverend Amani Henry. Thank you. Thank you. We are truly blessed, truly blessed. Well, as I've indicated, this is um, our Earth Day Sunday, as well as our Advocacy Day, uh, Ecumenical Advocacy Day. And in looking at, you know, our Earth, you know, we've heard much said about the condition and how really we are destroying God's creation. You know, folks are running around trying to claim that there is no climate change. However, we just had snow one day and 80 the next day. We know that something is going on in the world. And I was looking, I found some information that talked about just even our waste and how our waste is destroying the, the, the earth. We are, the U.S. is one, the number one producer of plastic. And plastic is one of the most significant contributors to our contamination and destruction of our waterways and our lands. Um, the U.S. ranks in the top 10, I believe, if not the top 10, the top 20, because we are producing 35 million tons of plastic, and only 8.3% of that gets recycled. The rest of it just lays out in our waters, on our beaches, in the landfills. And I, I saw something that said it takes like a thousand years or so for plastic to dissolve and go away. And so with it just hanging around, clogging up our ocean waves, it's killing marine animals. Over one million marine animals die due to plastic pollution. And I mean, the situation has become so serious and so severe that the country of South Africa, they have, are making lemonade and trying to be creative to make lemonade out of these lemons. And they have used over 10,566 gallons of plastic. And they used it to make roads. Hallelujah. That's what we have to do. We have got to begin, in addition, to trying to limit our use of plastic and paper products. You know, I'm, I'm the queen of paper products because I hate washing dishes, you know, but I, you know, sometimes I'm just gonna have to start washing more dishes because all of that paper, you know, used once and tossed, that's filling up our landfills. These 
plastic bottles, and I'm a bottled water drinker. I don't know. I, I guess I used to drink water out the faucet somehow, and it came up with bottled water, particularly spring water. I just can't drink faucet water anymore. So I'm drinking all of these bottles of water, and yes, contributing to the contamination. And so I know it's incumbent upon all of us, you know, this, this shift that we've been through in this pandemic has really given us pause on many things. And one of the other things that we need to make sure that we have pause on and kind of shift and change our behavior is just how we're using paper products, plastics, and those things that are filling our landfill. Um, even the Kenya, Kenya, and I, I, I want to travel there someday, um, and it's going to be interesting doing so because Kenya has actually banned plastics can't get plastic bottles in Kenya. And so, beloved, we have just really got to recognize that, you know, while we come here and we sit to worship, how we live our lives is also evidence of our worship and our praise and what we're giving to God. And when we're destroying God's earth, this earth that he created and gave to us to tend to, and we have done a poor, poor job. We've got to do better. We've got to do better. So just keep that in mind next time you're getting ready to toss that water bottle, that plastic water bottle into the trash can. Throw it into the recycle bin. Even now, you can also recycle, I'm told, um, uh, pizza uh, cartons. Recycle those too. Even though they have a little bit of food, get as much of it out as you can. But recycle. We have just really got to begin to be conscientious about how we dispose of our grace and making use, you know, using things more than once. That's, that, that's my spiel, I get off my soapbox because I know I'm ready and I'm preaching to myself too because I know <laughs> I am bad. Uh, but we have got to do better because God's earth is a gift to us and we do not want to trample misuse or abuse God's great gift. So keep that in mind as we go forward and as you are living life. Just make sure to keep in mind that this is indeed um, God's creation and we need to do our best to preserve it. Well, on next Sunday, I'm inviting everyone to come and be with us on next Sunday. Next Sunday, we are celebrating Law Day. Yes, yes. I am merging my occupation and my vocation. And I have uh, asked some of uh, leading jurists and attorneys to come and be with us. So you won't want to miss that next week. Uh, and going into uh, this coming week, uh, do keep, uh, and I, wow, I forgot my thought just that fast about to tell you this age. <laughs> well, on that, that's telling me that it's time to go to prayer. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's time to go to prayer. And as we go into prayer, uh, we do want to continue to keep uh, the family of Alan May. Lifted. Uh, we do not have any arrangements as of yet. I did speak with the family this week, um, and so the arrangements are still pending, but we do want to keep them lifted in prayer. And we're still praying for John, uh, brother Peoples, um, baby Demetrius. Uh, we hope that he's doing, is he home yet? No, he's not home. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are still praying for baby Demetrius. Uh, it was thought that he was going to come home last a week, or a week before last, but uh, he's still in the hospital, so let us continue to lift up uh, uh, Demetrius Hill, Karad, did I say her name right? Karad, keep Karad, and, uh, and of course, Grandma, Reverend Renee, uh, lifted in prayer, and as always, we are still playing, praying and standing in solidarity and unity with the people of the Ukraine. So keep them lifted in your prayer as well. And so now, uh, Reverend Renee is going to come and lift up our altar call. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Um, I'd like to just take just a couple moments just to thank my Saunders Memorial, Alan Temple, 
church family and friends. I thank you so much for your prayers. Being on a sick bed is no joke. And I thank you. I thank God for his healing. And I thank you that you sat and you prayed for me through this time. I just can't, I just can't speak how much it means to me knowing that you were there and you stood in the gap. And I thank you for that. Amen. 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 Let me bow our heads in prayer. Most holy and everlasting Father, sweet heavenly Father, sweet heavenly spirit, sweet heavenly dove, we're forever grateful and thankful that you gave us the opportunity to come together virtually, Heavenly Father, that we can touch and agree right now, Heavenly Father, how good your grace and your mercy is, Heavenly Father. We come before you right now with thankful hearts, with, with, with repentant hearts, with Heavenly Father. Just thanking you, Heavenly Father, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you're about to do, Heavenly Father. We lift up right now all the names that have been lifted up, all the names that have been called off, and their names that have not been called off, Heavenly Father, but may be scrolling across the screen right now. We pray that your grace and your mercy will endure, Heavenly Father, will strengthen, Heavenly Father, the yokes will be broken, Heavenly Father. We pray for addictions, Heavenly Father, that that will be relieved. We pray for those who are laying in sick bed right now. We pray for those who are suffering from cancer, those who are suffering through lupus, those that are suffering whatever it is that they are suffering from, Heavenly Father. Somebody is going through hospice right now, Heavenly Father. Some family is praying and holding and just coming together for their family members right now. We pray through every endeavor and every situation that's being lifted up right now. We pray for the families that are uh, in the U Ukraine, for the Ukraine government, Heavenly Father. We don't know. All, all we ask is that you intercede. We don't know and understand everything, Heavenly Father. But we just thank you that we live in a country right now that we can come together and touch and agree right now. We just pray and we lift up every situation. It is in the name of Jesus we continue to pray. It, and the congregation says, Amen. Amen. Well, as I indicated earlier again, um, this is Ecumenical Advocacy Day. And it is a, a, the brainchild of the UCC Church, but it is a call to all faith traditions who have at their foundation justice, peace, and preservation of our earth and our world at their foundation to come together to energize, motivate, and encourage all of us as a collective body to do the work that God came to earth to show us how to do and which he has empowered and instilled in us the will to do. And so we are blessed today to be able to hear from one of the master homileticians, a master preacher, uh, and none other than Reverend Dr. Otis Moss. Uh, he is the pastor of Trinity UCC Church in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, you may be more familiar with that church as the Church of Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright. Uh, so you know this brother has got to be bad because he seceded. Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright. And so I assure you that you will not be disappointed in this word that we are about to hear from Reverend Dr. Otis Moss to motivate us, to encourage us to do the work that God has purposed for us to do, making sure that all of us are accessing and able to receive the abundance that God has promised. Just like a tree that 
that's been planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Oh, 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 oh the winds are blowing all around.
to my UCC brothers and sisters, uh, I thank you for, for allowing me to have this opportunity to present a little homily as we speak about our advocacy and the days that we are called to advocate uh, for those who have been marginalized uh, to this ever widening community of incredible human beings who deeply love our God and serve Christ. It is a privilege uh, to be with you virtually at this moment. If we could, at this moment, if we could just have a word of prayer, let us go to God at this time. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and see if there is any destructive way in me. When you discover what does not belong, take it from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength, and without a doubt, you are my redeemer. Holy Spirit, do thy will, do thy will this day. In the mighty, wonderful, powerful, liberating, salvific, holy, healing name, we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. And those who love God may say, Amen. I'd like to lift up a passage of scripture, I believe it was already read, but lift it up once again uh, from a different vantage point, coming from Luke, uh, the, the 19th chapter. Uh, this triumphal entry that is often used during uh, Palm Sunday, we lift up uh, beginning where it reads in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem as he had approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and enter it. and You will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus through their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it, and he went along. People spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God with loud voices and of all for all the miracles they had seen. Untie the colt and bring it here. Untie the colt and bring it here. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. I'd like to place a tag here <clears throat> at this moment and for us, for, for the brief time that we have, for us to deal with just a simple idea of it's time to untie the colt. One of the controversial statements that is offered today in some theological circles is the idea that Jesus is a liberator. Now, for those within the United Church of Christ, that may not seem as radical. Across the expanse of Americanized Christianity, to say Jesus is a liberator causes committees to gather together in the South and study groups to begin to tweet in the West and for people to write papers in the East and in the North about what is meant by Jesus being a liberator. 
There's one friend who comes from the evangelical framework of westernized Christianity. He said, you mentioned that Jesus is a liberator. Jesus is a savior. And I responded to say, I didn't say that, that he was not. I said, Jesus is a liberator. This is interesting that there are so many within our tradition and traditions that to think of Jesus as a liberator is now for some code for some destructive, subversive, socialist, Antifa, BLM language. And I would say that uh, that is actually a badge of honor. If framing Jesus within uh, the category of liberator causes such consternation that seminary presidents in the South have to gather together and say that we protest the use of that term. But as one who does not come solely out of the Western framework of Christianity, but one who is within the black tradition, the black church tradition, specifically what is known as black religiosity and spirituality. One cannot divorce salvation from liberation. For it is only a partial gospel and very Americanized version of the gospel. If Jesus simply is a personal savior, because as long as Jesus is a personal savior, then there is no requirement for us to do public work. Uh, now, I would not in any way say that Jesus is not uh, personal, but, uh, but when one collectively looks at the gospel, it is not from that framework uh, that Jesus does Jesus' work. Jesus nowhere in the gospel is the saying that I've come to be your personal savior. This very Americanized idea. Nothing wrong with it in its frame or on its shelf. But to divorce the idea of liberation, this collective community engagement, is problematic to the gospel. Because in these days, in these moments in, in America, we, we need a church that is unrepentant about saying that Jesus is not only Savior, but Jesus is liberator. Jesus is healer. Jesus is barrier breaker. Jesus is one who lifts up and also tears down human walls that have been created to keep us from connecting with the full humanity and spirit by which we have been designed. I come, as I mentioned, from that black church tradition where we inherently saw Jesus as a liberator. And when one comes from this framework, uh, from a cultural and also exegetical perspective. It, it changes the reading when you look at the gospel. Jesus is a liberator. What does this mean to liberate? It means that when one is chained, they are set free. What does this mean to be liberated? It means uh, that when one is labeled and marginalized, that all of a sudden they are brought into the light. What does it mean? It means that someone else does not define who you are, but you are a child of God. For scripture says that God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Jesus is a liberator. And so if Jesus is a liberator, it then demands and states uh, for us that we must recognize as the people of God 
that the church collectively must be a liberating church. A liberating church. A loving church. A church that breaks down walls, but a church that is unafraid to face the bruises that we inflict upon each other and upon our world. Where we do not jettison our spirituality, uh, just simply to offer a prescription of policy, uh, but they are all together, the sacred and the secular, mixed together. Jesus is a liberator. And I would challenge, challenge, challenge us as, as we examine this particular scripture, that with that idea, theologically in mind, that we will see Scripture in a different framework when we know that Jesus is a liberator, a scripture that we have looked at many times before, especially during the season that we know as Lent, specifically on Palm Sunday. The triumphant entry, this triumphal entry of Jesus going into Jerusalem as people are shouting for this revolutionary rabbi by the name of Jesus, who lives in occupied territory, where the shadow of Roman power is upon his brow, and the powerful love of God is upon his heart. Where those who have uh, some degree of local power, the church folks and the lawyers, tax collectors are worried about this person by the name of Jesus. But I've always loved this text, and I believe that we have often talked around some other aspects of liberation that are inherent within this text. Jesus has already left Bethphage and Bethany and is on his way in uh, to Jerusalem. And he makes a direction, gives a direction to uh, those disciples. He says, brothers, this is what I need y'all to do. I want you to go into, uh, into the community and I want you to find a colt, a young donkey, one that has not been ridden. I want you to untie it and I want you to bring it to me. Hmm. The text speaks of Jesus talking to his disciples, instructing them to find a colt unridden, to find uh, a colt, a, a colonized colt, uh, a disenfranchised donkey, and bring, bring him to me. For the colt, a, a baby donkey, was conditioned to be in service for someone else. The cult was born into the world, on the outskirts of, of our imagination, just simply born into this world to service someone else. Uh, and based upon the family history, was not destined for greatness. It was doomed to be a beast of burden. This is a cult. This is not. This cult will not grow up to be a horse, but it will grow up to be a donkey. Your, your role, your job, your place in the whole hierarchy that we have created, in the system that we have designed, is you, it is designed specifically that you are to serve and that you are to carry the load. And Jesus orders his disciples, I want you to go and find a donkey that has been domesticated, that uh, has been colonized, a donkey uh, that has been colonized, a disenfranchised donkey, a colonized cult, a cult uh, who was birthed into oppression uh, for colonization and simply means that he lived a life based on how other people defined him. Jesus wanted a colonized cult. Hmm. This was a colonized cult. It was colonized for the fact that it had to carry someone else's burden. It was colonized so that it could be used to empower and to enrich someone else. It was colonized. It was given a story by someone else saying that this is how high you can attain. You are simply a cult. You are simply a donkey. You are disenfranchised. So stay in your place, cult. Do not ask 
for any type of rights. Do not organize. Just stay in your place. Things will work out if you just stay in your place. Nobody thought this cult had much worth. But Jesus wanted this colonized cult uh, as his main mode of transportation. Isn't it interesting that Jesus has interest in what everybody else has already dismissed. That that I want the cult that has been colonized. I want the disenfranchised donkey. I, I want what you have already assumed is only to be used in one way. And I'm about to transform what you think about the cult, what you think about the donkey. You think I should ride a horse, but I'm not Caesar. I am Christ. And I'm looking for a colt. I'm looking for a donkey. Untie this colt, this colonized colt tied to a pulse. The colt, the colt had restricted movement. L look at this now. Jesus is about to liberate a colt. The colt was tied to a post. He was tied, not necessarily in chains, but, but, but was tied down. In other words, the colt had limited ability to be able to see the fullness of the cult's experience. Because the cult was tied to the post, because the one who tied the cult to the post did not want the cult to run away and did not want the cult to see the fullness of what was around. Because if he was untied, he might see a different sky. If he was untied, he might see a different landscape. If he is untied and Jesus sends the disciples to go untie someone who had been tied up. And tied up by a particular definition of what the cult can do. Tied up by a particular perspective and framework and system that says that you must stay in this place. Hmm. Ah, if we begin to look at how America functions on so many levels, that it's always tying up either groups of people or ideas and limits them in terms of what they can and or should not or should do. And here's Jesus. He does not go himself. He sends some brothers to say, I want you to go and untie this particular cult. Uh, somebody wanted to maintain control of the cult. Somebody wanted to keep the cult in the cult's place. Somebody wanted to use the cult for profit. Uh, somebody wanted the cult to expand uh, their capitalist interests. Uh, but Jesus sends uh, these brothers to go untie this cult. And if this cult is untied, it changes the life of the cult. Because no longer is the cult tied up with a limited look. The cult is now set free. But the people who set free of the cult are sent by Jesus, Jesus does not go himself. In other words, those who represent the church are given an assignment to untie what has been tied up. An assignment the church has been given during these days and that it was part of our specific assignment to find out uh, those places in which uh, people and uh, systems are tying people up and how do we untie so that those uh, who have been locked down and disenfranchised can blossom and exist to their full God-given potential. And Jesus tells, tells, tells these disciples, I want you to untie the cult. But I want the colonized cult, the one that's been tied up in the same place, in the same position for someone else's pleasure. And some people want to make sure that certain individuals stay tied up. I'm always fascinated, fascinated by, uh, by those who get so hmm, uh, upset this day and age about particular things. I had a conversation uh, with someone who was talking about uh, critical race theory. They were not critical, didn't know anything about race, had no theory, uh, but they were so very, very fearful. Fearful that uh, if certain things were taught in school, uh, that it would be so destructive to children 
And I simply retorted and said, you mean things like history? That they might be set free and not tied up anymore? That they might start a revolution? All of these young cults in elementary school uh, might suddenly rise up and realize the commonality, the flaws of our democracy, and they might decide that they want to engage and rebuild these yet to be United States of America so that all can participate in this space of an American project of democracy? I, I don't know. I'm not fearful of it. I'm glad that we are engaging it, that we need people who are willing to untie, to untie the cult. We've been stayed, we have been tied for so long, you were tied up because there are those who deeply fear that you might get free. Because if you are free, you might hear the words of Sojourner Truth say, ain't I a woman? If, if you are free, uh, you might learn about the legacy and the blessing of a Bayard Rustin. If, if you get free, you might read the words of Toni Morrison. If, if, if you get free, you might actually read the Bible. And what you do to the least of these, you also do to me. If you are untied. And how are we tied up in so many levels and in so many ways? tied up with peculiar doctrines and tied up, especially the church. It is fascinating to me. The church is so tied up, stuck on a post. There's only things, certain things that we can do. There's only certain music that can be played in the church. We're tied up. Uh, there are certain things that can be said and cannot be said. We are, we are tied up. There are certain things that you can, you can only wear this. You cannot wear this. Ah, we are so tied up. Here is Jesus sending his disciples to say, untie this cult. Cult, this cult is untied. There just might be a revolution. Hmm. Cult revolution or a stampede. Because no longer will that cult uh, be framed by the desires and the exploitation of the one who thought he was the owner of the cult. But not only that, is that Jesus says, I, I want a cult that nobody's ridden. Hmm. And this is a word for the church. I want an unridden cult. In other words, I don't want a domesticated donkey. I want an unridden cult. For a domesticated donkey already has been placed within a position where that donkey believes that there are certain things I can do or I cannot do that it's not possible to make change, that I must stay in my place because they have been domesticated in certain ways. And that is the word for the church because in many ways, some of us, and even in our congregations, and as preachers, have become domesticated donkeys. We have been serving in position so long, spouting the same rhetoric over and over again that, that we don't even believe that we can make transformation within our own communities or even in this nation. It is the challenge of the church to break the domestication, the colonization. And it is the challenge of the church that, that we have to build the relationships for those uh, who have not been domesticated. In other words, another generation that does not have the limits and blinders that we have to say what the church can and cannot do. We are so limited, but there is a generation, a generation uh, just like in the text, an unridden cult. In other words, a younger donkey, one that has not been domesticated, uh, one that has not been broken by society, that still has the ability to grow and change and see the world radically. We need to build that kind of relationship so that for the church to be able to thrive in this season and not be limited upon the domestication and our donkey-esque focus of what liberation can and cannot be. Jesus says, bring me the one no one's written. I don't want the one that believes that there's only one way to function. There's only one way to live. There's only one thing that can happen. Only one way it can happen. I need the unridden donkey. Jesus wants an unridden cult, 
not a domesticated donkey, even though the colt was colonized, he was not yet poisoned by the process of domestic, domestic, domestication. He was unridden. He was young, too young to believe. He still believed in possibility. He still believed that he could protest and change democracy. He still believed that a new world was possible. He still had a hope in his spirit. And part of the responsibility of the church is to sure ensure that we do not poison the next generation with our doctrine of domestication. We do not domesticate their dreams in such a way to say uh, that there is a ceiling upon them, uh, that we must allow them to thrive if we are to alter things in this world and in this nation. We must see the liberation framework of Jesus demanding that we untie the cult, demanding that we untie another generation, demanding uh, that we go into spaces where people have been locked up and locked down and we are willing to be on the front line, untie the cult. Hmm. Liberation will flow. This uh, colonized cult, uh, this disenfranchised donkey. Jesus did not want the domesticated donkey, but uh, a wild, untamed donkey, one that doesn't follow all of the rules, doesn't know the liturgy, can't sing all the songs, isn't quite sure about uh, the fashion for Sunday, one that raises questions, why do you do it? What is the purpose behind it? Explain it to me. I need some energy like that. And that is what the church is lacking because we are always trying to place a lid and domesticate the geniuses within our community who are not from our generation. You see, domesticated donkeys put limits on God. Hmm. Domesticated churches put limits on the Holy Spirit. Uh, d domesticated, d domesticated church folk are dangerous because they are the ones who will always intervene to keep people from doing the work of liberation. Hmm. I must share the story with you, and I must also bid you a good day. But there's a story we have, what is known as a drug, known as the drug and alcohol recovery ministry here at Trinity United Church of Christ. It is one of the most amazing revivals I've ever been in. It's not because of, of a preacher or because of the music. It is because that we bring into the sanctuary different programs from around Chicago and people who are addicts are struggling are in this worship experience. And what is so beautiful about this is there's nobody who's really domesticated uh, because some have been in worship spaces, some have not. They're not quite sure of the particular protocol, but there's something that is so powerful when they come together, when they share their stories and they talk about what they have been through and the injuries that they have caused and the injuries that they have witnessed and received. There's something uplifting when they do something called the count, where they go uh, down the line of how many people are sober for 25 years, 24 years, and, and on and on. And people stand up and they clap and they cheer. But that's not the moving part. It's when they get down to not one year, but when they get down to how many people have been sober for one week. But it's when they get down to how many people have been sober for 24 hours. And when those people stand up, the entire church erupts and you see tears falling from people's eyes and people running to that individual and hugging them and saying, just keep coming back. That I'm standing with you. I'm, I'm praying for you. And immediately following that, you have people coming to the altar 
saying that I want a major shift in my life. When the ministry started, there were those who didn't believe that this was the appropriate place to have that kind of worship. They had a domesticated mindset. But now it is an annual event and has been an annual event for many years at this church. Because the pastor, my predecessor, Dr. Wright, was told by God, make sure you make space. Make space for those who have been tied up. And that is our call. To make space for those who have been tied up. And so these individuals were sent to go and tie uh, this donkey. And the donkey was brought to Jesus. And Jesus climbed on top of the donkey. They put a cloak up there and he comes into Jerusalem. And people are shouting, ah, there is Jesus. But, but please understand this, uh, that we celebrate the disciples and we uh, celebrate all of those who are part of this particular story. But the one who lifted Jesus up higher, higher than Peter ever lifted Jesus, uh, higher uh, than Luke ever lifted Jesus, uh, higher than Matthew lifted Jesus, was this unridden cult, was this uh, disenfranchised donkey, who now has a part of history and brings Jesus into Jerusalem. I want you to understand, beloved, that the role and the call of the church is to be a liberator, is to share the message of Jesus. But Jesus is telling us, too, we have to find those who have been tied up we have to discover those who've, uh, who've been disenfranchised and who've been marginalized. Part of the role of the church is to release and liberate those at the direction of our liberator, Jesus. We're called to untie. Untie those who've been tied up because they could not participate in this democracy or this yet-to-be democracy. What shall you do this season? Shall you be a domesticated church or will you be a liberating space where you are unafraid to untie the cult and set free the disenfranchised and bless those who have been broken and stand as an ally and an accomplice with those who have been bruised. In this day, at this moment, this is what our world needs. People who are unafraid to untie some things so they can be set free. Love and mercy Pour your wisdom on our souls By your all-sustaining power Keep our spirit strong and bold Lift our eyes to see your vision Of a world emergence need Grant us courage then to follow Bringing comfort with each day. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. God of justice, love and mercy, with compassion let us care. As we come in humble weakness, may your strength be us to share. Press our hearts to know. Let's
sisters, all who suffer, may your kindness set us free. This love and mercy send us out and make us bold as we strive for your high calling. Let our hands your mercies hold. You have blessed us with abundance, gifts to share with those in need. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Give us courage to follow through, bringing comfort to your people with each deed. Yes, God, you have blessed us with abundance, gifts to share with those in need. Let us follow you as you lead, for it is indeed time to untie the coat. I want to thank Reverend Dr. Moss for that awesome, awesome word that has encouraged, I hope it has encouraged you as it has encouraged me to continue the work that I know God is calling us to do. The work of uplifting and upbuilding the community, making sure that the least of these are taken care of and that none of us are living in oppression. Thank you again, Dr. Moss. But the doors of the church are open. And if you're, you want to be an untied coat, if you want to experience the liberation and the love of Christ, I extend to you now an opportunity to come. Drop your name in the chat email me or text me if you have never accepted Christ into your life as your Savior. If you have not surrendered your will to the will of God, I offer you an opportunity now to come because I assure you, I assure you that walking with Jesus is like nothing else. I'm not going to tell you, you know, that, oh, yeah, everything will be perfect and you'll have no problems. Uh, but walking with Jesus allows you, it strengthens you to weather the storm. It gives you understanding of your storm. But most importantly, when we walk close with Jesus, it gives us understanding of ourselves as created by Christ so that we can move forward in the fullness of all that God has for us. So I offer that opportunity to you today. Drop your name in the chat, text me, email me, and I will call you personally to welcome you in to God's kingdom, praying the prayer of salvation and helping you to surrender your will to the will of God. But maybe you have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. But somehow you don't have a church home where you're working out your soul salvation. Well, we would love to have you here with us at Saunders and Allen. A loving church. A liberating church. A church that is on the move. Trying to be God's presence in this community. 
and we would love to have you come and join with us. So again, drop your name in the chat, text me or email me, and it would be my great pleasure to call and welcome you into this community of faith. But maybe you're not ready to join. Maybe you're not ready to join. But we would welcome you to come and partner with us. Partner with us, not just with your finances, but partner with us with your gifts and your time. Because I'm telling you, God is calling us to a big, huge work. And I know that the talent, the gifts are out there that we need to fulfill everything that God is purposing for us to do. So won't you come on and be obedient and join with us on this journey as we continue to walk in faith, doing the will of God and trying to impact his community as he has ordained and purpose for us to do. And I am so thankful and grateful to our faithful foundation who has enabled us to do the work that we have done thus far, who enabled us to continue to go forward doing the ministry that we are doing. And so I am so grateful and I hope that you will join with them, with our faithful, by supporting this ministry. You could give via Givelify. You may mail your checks in, or if you're so inclined, you may come and drop them by the church. But we would just love to have you and would greatly appreciate your joining with us and with the faithful foundation of this community of faith in doing the work that God has called us to do. Well, as we come to the close of this worship experience, as always, I leave you with a prayer. Well, this week I'm going to leave you with a, a slightly different prayer. I usually create a prayer, but this prayer comes from the New Zealand prayer book. And it is a reworking, I would say, of the Lord's Prayer. But it is a wonderful, wonderful prayer that I want to share with you and leave with you. And then following that prayer, stay tuned for a video on the God's gift of earth. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice, may it be followed by the peoples of the earth. May your heavenly will be done by all created beings. May your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come here on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. And the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. And in times of temptation and test, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, Free us, for you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. So let's go untie the coat. God bless you.